there was another incidence of melamine only in China associated with milk powder tampered with melamine. So it became a big issue. So the industry was saying, OK, we have had, we didn't expect melamine to make it into our food stream. What else could happen? OK, so that's how we have started working with this vibrational spectroscopy as an authentication and detection of adulteration in foods. And these are some of the, this is what we're trying to do. We're going to look at the spectral characteristics of pure material. And pure material is the toughest thing to obtain because you have to make sure that it's pure. So you actually have to go to the producer and make sure that they're giving you a pure compound. But if we have this knowledge of what is a pure compound, then anything that deviates from that is suspicious. OK? We can go into more inf information about why this deviating. OK? Actually, I went to a conference about the melamine. And the conference, there was an expert on the melamine incident. And he was saying that they were using Keldal. Do you know Keldal? Keldal is the standard method for determination of protein. It's a digestion method. So you don't measure the, the nitrogen in the protein. You measure the nitrogen that you have digested and form ammonia. So you're, you're making ammonia. So it's an indirect. They started to, to have problems with some of the near infrared systems because the near infrared systems were telling the, that it was not a spectra that it recognized. But then they went with Keldal, and Keldal was giving a right level for that. So we need to look at screening, better screenings, for this type of tampering. So we're proposing mid infrared. Uh, we have done this with Sacha Inchi. Sacha Inchi is a Peruvian peanut and is really rich in linolenic acid. Linolenic acid is a very important uh, free fatty acid for a lot of functions. It's an essential uh, free fatty acid. Um, so this such a inchi has levels compared to flax, okay? And here's the other. It's very expensive, okay? It's making it into the U.S., but it's a very expensive oil. What we did was we went to the market, and we started looking at different types of um, such a inchi oils, and what we found is that in one company our method reproducibly said that there was no such a inchi. We did GC analysis, and we found that it was only corn. So they were using corn oil instead of the such a inchi. So this was one of the, one of the first studies that we did that we, were, we actually found adulteration in the market. Uh, this is another. We're working with cocoa butter. And this is just to tell you we got lots of samples from a big producer of chocolate. And they sent us all their samples that they were obtaining in the lapses of about a month. OK? So we had a lot of samples. Now, you can see there's a lot of dispersion. OK? So there's a lot of differences in this cocoa butter. Um, some cocoa butter is allowed to use other fats other than cocoa butter. And they're called cocoa equivalents, OK? So we don't know much more about those, those, those fats because they were obtained commercially. What we found was that then that we can discriminate them based on their chemical composition of the fatty acids, OK? Um, what we did is we also, also obtained two samples that we knew they were pure. One was obtained from 
West Africa, the other one was obtained from Indonesia. Those two samples are here. Okay? All the others, we don't know much about them. Okay? But we took then these two samples and then we contaminated them with, co with mineral oil, palm oil, cotton seed, coconut. And look at this. This is our authentic samples. And here is what we spiked. So we can very easily identify tampering if we can with the mean infrared. So this is some of the things that we're doing. Another thing is the company sent us all their quality uh, assurance data. So we had melting points, free fatty acids, and triacylglycerol data. Actually, free fatty acids too. I'm not showing that. But we can develop regressions for the major fatty acids and the major triacylglycerols to predict them very quickly. So lots of opportunities for different things. The last thing that I want to talk is about infrared systems, the portable ones. And we were um, really lucky yesterday for the workshop because we had Agilent brought one of the portable systems to do demonstrations, and we had some fun. We even tested lipstick. We were looking at lipstick, and we were uh, actually uh, getting some spectra. Are we there? You know who's that guy? Huh? Mr. Spock from the Star Trek. Um, we're not there, but we're getting closer. Actually, this is one device that is a portable unit that you can take to the field. Okay? Actually, this was a, an idea of, I gave a seminar, and this was the topic. And they gave me this topic, and I loved it. So, uh, so are we there? Uh, we have in the market right now a lot of portable systems. This is a near-infrared. It's a handheld near-infrared system. This is a system that uh, is for chemical identification. It's uh, very powerful. Um, they're using it a lot uh, by the Department of Defense to look for uh, liquids or unidentified material. Uh, and this is the new generation of portable systems by Agilent. Uh, we have done this work on trans fats, and we were able to, this is the, the regular method by the AOAC. This is a method that we use with, with a better detector. It's a triple bounce. This is a single bounce. So we were increasing the signal and, and then this is one of the handhelds. This is a handheld, the small one, okay? And, but we were getting nice data, okay? We were getting really nice data about applications for determining trans fats. So this was one of the applications. Why trans fats is important? It's mandatory to report trans fat levels in the labels. Okay? Now, under law in the FDA, zero trans doesn't mean that there's no trans. It has to be below 0.5 grams per serving. So if you manage to get your levels of trans fats below 0.5 grams per serving, you can label it as a zero trans. Okay? So you can find a product that has partially hydrogenated oil, but if they have done well their formulation, it can be labeled as a zero trans fat. So this is a way that we can actually look for um, levels in foods to make sure that they comply with the law. Uh, we have also used this in tomato. Um, we have uh, look at sugars and acids in tomatoes. And we, we look at all these systems. And the bench top was our gold standard. Okay? Uh, what we did was, so this is the spectra 
that we collected with this system, which is the True Defender, the Flex Scan, which is this one that is a portable, and this is the benchtop. Okay? Um, this is the signal that we're monitoring. The second stage was we use the benchtop, which is this, and then we put our sample with the transmission. And this is the signal with the transmission. And you can see that we're increasing the signal significantly. Okay? All these bumps that you see here, that's information. So we did the regression for citric acid. And we were very happy with these uh, regressions. We did then the regression for glucose. And these are the regression. The challenge with these samples is we obtain these samples from five different counties. So like five different, uh, California is huge, like five different states uh, from 35 to 40 different varieties that were grown two different years. So we have year to year variability. We have variety variability. We have soil differences. And with all that, we managed to, do, to get a very good regression. So actually, we're working now trying to incorporate these models into field systems for use by the industry. Uh, this is some of the data. Most of the, our correlations were about 0.8. So for these complex matrices, this is very exciting. And our standard error of, of, of predictions for the, the validation were very good. Very good. They were very comparable with what we, what we took as our gold standard for spectroscopy. So we were very happy. Acrylamide. Acrylamide is a known neurotoxin carcinogen that is found in, a, in several foods that are exposed to high temperature. So one of the sources of acrylamide that, we, that we're concerned in the United States is potato chips. Potato chips naturally have the two components that lead to the formation of acrylamide, and it's through the Mylar reaction. So the reaction between a reducing sugar and asparagine is going to lead to the formation of acrylamide. And this happens at high temperature, usually temperatures above 170. So frying, roasting uh, will lead to the formation of baking forms acrylamide. Um, why is that important? Proposition 65, this is a happy meal, and it has to bear by law this uh, warning, OK? because of the potential presence of acrylamide. So under the law, if it's below 300 ppvs, you don't have to use that label. Okay? So we're trying to develop technology for the industry that can measure these low levels quickly so that they can monitor this um, acrylamide. Uh, we have used the, the carry, the portable system, we're getting right now errors in around 100 ppvs. Uh, this is the bench top. It's about 100 ppvs. Uh, for sweet potatoes, it's about 70 ppvs. So we're looking at ppv levels now. We have also used the, the handheld near-infrared. And we're, we're getting about 90 ppv levels. So we're well within the levels that we feel that the industry will really pay attention or, or take this technology forward. Uh, what we need is more data, because this was done with 50 commercially available potato chips. And what we want is to increase that to more than 100, to really have a well-validated method. Um, and with that, I thank you. Please. Yes, all those you can find um, immunomagnetic beads for salmonella, 
for Listeria monocytogenes. So there's a specific for Listeria monocytogenes, and there's a, spe a specific bits for E. coli 0157H7. And I think that there's some for the H H EHEC, which, is, which are the other enterohemorrhagic. So they're available. Um, what you can do is you can use that technology and try to use it for other type of ligands. So you can use allergens because those are proteins. You can ligate, ligate those. So if you know the chemistry to make those ligations with the immunomanative beads, then um, you can test many different opportunities. Actually, the company that we buy it is in Vitrogen. Um, they will also customize uh, beads for you. So if you, if, if you want a specific an antibody to be tagged with the beads, you can ask for that service. Yeah. The what? We were getting data on or, or, or reliable signal with about 100 cells. So we needed to grow it to about 100 cells to 1,000 cells to get enough signal. Uh, that's why we, were, we needed the, um, the microscope, because the microscope has a, a much better detector much powerful detector, so that we can get to those very low levels. Um, but we were doing it at about 100. Um, now, one of the advantages of Raman is that if you do Raman micros microspectroscopy, you can get to um, fields of analysis of about one micron. So one micron, you can start doing single cell analysis. So with Raman, we cannot do it. In the field of, uh, um, of analysis for mean infrared, is about 100 micron. So even if you can see the, the, the cell, the, the amount of light that is going to your detector is going to go to involve other material. But with Raman, if you do Raman microspectroscopy, you can have a field of vision or a field of information as low as one micron. So there's a lot of uh, research now, single cell identification using libraries. So that, that's very powerful.